Thank you, Russ. Well, again, we want to welcome you. What a beautiful Lord's Day the Lord has given us. We welcome you, those of you that are here in our sanctuary, and those of you that are joining us today on Facebook. Don't touch that mouse. You're in the right place. As you can see, our worship leader, Mark, is not here today. He's taking the day off, and we wish him and his family well. They're enjoying their time away. I have the pleasure and the privilege to serve today. Today's worship service is about what God has done for us. The triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And a lot of what we are going to focus on today is about the Holy Spirit. Not much is ever said about him, but for those of us who have accepted Christ into our hearts, just as Christ promised before he left us to go to heaven, he would send the Comforter. And so we that have claimed Christ as our Lord and Savior have the Holy Spirit residing in us. Isn't that amazing? So we're never alone. And we can, no matter what we're facing, no matter how difficult the trials might be, or what is going on all around this globe, we know that he is in control, and he can sustain us through each and everything. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your incomparable love, for your faithfulness and your loving kindness, the grace and mercy that you extend to us every single day. And thank you that you are true to your word, that you never leave us nor forsake us. And we thank you for this privilege to come together to lift up your name through song and through the preached word. And we ask, Lord, that you would just fill this sanctuary with your presence so much so that we would feel energized, that we would desire to serve you more as a result of being part of your family. Thank you again for your incomparable love. We lift this time of worship and the preached word to you. May you be glorified in all things and your kingdom expanded here on earth. Because it's in Jesus' name we all ask. Amen. Let's stand together and worship our Lord and Savior.
Scripture says this about Christ and the Holy Spirit. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. For if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if you live by the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body. You will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Let us continue now with our worship of the Holy Spirit and His sweet, sweet Spirit. There's a sweet, sweet Spirit. everyone how are you church I hope everybody's doing good we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 13 today so I invite you to turn with me there to Hebrews chapter 13 if we were going by a song I heard growing up we might could figure out what the topic is going to be today uh, the song went kind of like this first comes love then comes marriage then comes and you might think a baby in a baby carriage but in the book of Hebrews in chapter 13 it's love it's marriage and then it's money and so that's what we're going to talk about today is money and um, we you know when we talked about love not long ago we, we we talked about how love was joyful and it was willing and it was giving it's always more than words you got to put action behind it for it to really be love and we looked in verse 1 of how we're supposed to love a brethren, but then we got in verse 2, and we're supposed to love strangers, 
people that we don't even know. And then we got into verse 3, and it talked about how we're supposed to love the persecuted and prisoners. And, and that was a couple of weeks ago. And then last week we talked about marriage, and it, of course, is obvious that we're supposed to love our spouse when we're married. But, it, you know, it's axiomatic that Christians love God. It's, 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 everybody knows you're supposed to love God, and then we're supposed to love others, whether they're brethren or strangers or prisoners or our spouse. But does that mean we're supposed to love everything? Well, no. In fact, today it's about not loving something, not someone, but something, and the something is money. In fact, the whole topic today is about the love of money and how it's a problem for us. It's a problem because it's sinful, it leads into more sin, and it can even cost you your soul. And so we're going to see that today, but we're also going to find out how God has given us a way to fight that, to counteract it, to kind of work against it and to help us with to love what we're supposed to love. So let's read what the Bible says beginning in verse 5 of Hebrews 13 and find out what the Bible has to say to us about these things. It reads this way. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, and then two scriptures are quoted here, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Now, when we begin this topic of money, when thinking about money, understand from the very get-go, money is not the problem. That's not the issue here. Because money is neutral. It's neither good or bad. You can use it for good ways, you can use it for bad ways. But having money, earning money, working for money, none of that is a problem. In fact, things like work, uh, labor, earning, investing, saving, being thrifty, all of these sorts of things are talked about in Scripture, and they're even applauded in Scripture. They're encouraged in Scripture. So it's not even wrong to have ambition and to say, I want to do better in life. I want to earn more money. I want to make more. There's nothing wrong with that either. In fact, there's a lot of reasons why we need to make money. Um, I don't know if you know if it says this in the Bible, but it does that a righteous man will leave an inheritance to his children's children. It says that in the book of Proverbs. And so knowing that, I'm going to make sure if I ever have grandchildren that I'm going to put them in my will. I don't want my grandchildren to one day be reading the Bible, read that scripture, and say, well, a righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and granddaddy didn't leave me anything. I, I think that would be a bad testimony. In fact, I think there's a way in my will I could make it a testimony. I could quote that scripture, leave something to my grandchildren, and remind them that granddaddy's not a righteous man because he's a good man. He's a righteous man because Jesus was good. And I, who am bad, have been given his righteousness the day I put my faith in him. Uh, there, there's ways that you can even take scriptures like that and use them. Uh, it's good to earn money because you might have a mom that you need to take care of in her old age. You've got a family you need to provide for. And more money helps with that. And so there, there's lots of good reasons to earn money, to have money, and to spend money wisely. We, we need to be mindful of the money that God gives us as stewards of the resources God has put in our hand. And we need to be careful about that because the way that you spend money is often a reflection of where your heart is and, and what your life is like. In fact, there's been many a preacher over the years that says things along these lines. I can tell about a person's spiritual life by looking at their checkbook. A lot of truth in that. Uh, but, you know, a lot of us have received a check lately from the government, $1,200 for every adult, $500 for every dependent, uh, 16 and under. You know, even how you spend that money, you've got to be careful with it because you may not need it right now, so you may say, well, I could just go blow it. But a month from now when you're out of work because you've got COVID and you're sitting at home and you don't have any money coming in, that's what that money is for. And so if you spend it all now and you splurge on it, then later on you don't have any money and you need it then, well, the money that you were given that you, for when you needed it, you don't have it because you spent it on something else. Just be, be careful and take seriously the handling of your money. So the problem is not money, but the problem is the love of money. That's the issue here. 
And the love of money goes to an attitude within your heart. You see, you might think, well, he's talking to rich people today. No, in fact, I'm not. Because you can be poor and love money. You don't have to have money to love money. And on the same side, you can be very, very, very wealthy and not have a love for money at all. See, it has everything to do with where your heart is. If you have a desire for money and you cherish it and, and you are passionate about it and, and so much so that your joy, your happiness, your satisfaction with life depends on it, then you've crossed a line. Because the truth is, nothing that God has ever created is meant to satisfy us in that kind of a way. Now, money can bring you happiness in, the, in a short-term sort of way, but the ultimate satisfaction, happiness, and joy in life is meant to come from God. And, and you should never put money in the place of God. So if you're desiring, cherishing money, prioritizing it, longing for it, dreaming about it, finding your joy in it and it alone and saying, I can't be happy unless I have this then you've messed up. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says something to, about, to us about this. In verse 10 it says this, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor will he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. Why is that? Why can't you be satisfied with money if you love it? Because <laughs> you're always going to want a little bit more, aren't you? Never going to have enough. When you were a teenager, did you ever think in your mind, boy, if I can ever make X amount of dollars, I'll be happy. And then you made X amount of dollars when you got older and you thought when you got older and you were making X amount of dollars. Well, no, if I can just make this amount of money, then I'll be happy. I mean, it never stops, does it? What do you want? You always want a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And so the love of money is never going to bring you happiness, peace, contentment, or satisfaction, and it was never made to. And when you begin to love money in that way, it becomes sinful, but it can lead into even more sin. Listen to what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says this, These who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare, which many foolish and harmful desires I'm sorry, and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now think about that verse for just a minute. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now, just about every plant or weed you ever pull up, tree, whatever it is, it doesn't just have one root that goes down. There's usually many roots. So this is a root. Not all evil comes from loving money, but you, cannot, you probably can't name a sin that I can't figure out a way that love of money could cause somebody or entice somebody to go that way. Now, you can talk about illicit sexual activity. You ever heard of sugar daddies? Gold diggers? Do you think people don't manipulate other people and use sex to do it? To try to get what they want and get their way? Do people sell themselves in order to get more wealth? Absolutely they do. They do that stuff all the time. What about verbal abuse? Do you think there's some employer somewhere, some boss, some manager that has not berated employee over the top yelling and screaming and cursing at them? Uh, making them feel like a dog because maybe they broke something on the job site and what did it do? It cost them some money. Or maybe they did something wrong, made a mistake, and it's going to cost a customer. Costing money. And what do they do? Instead of treating that employee like a son or a daughter, like you'd want somebody to treat your son or daughter, you yell at them and treat them like they're nothing. Don't you think that's sinful? So, so you you got to be careful because all sorts of things can come from this. Greed is a sinful thing. Luke chapter 12 is a great chapter to go along with what we're talking about today. It, and if, if you've got time on your own, you can go back and read that whole chapter and it would help you. It says this in verse 15, Jesus was talking and said, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. Not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Some people think that life is all about what you get and what you earn, and they like to make themselves big shots, and so they have things that make them look prestigious, 
and they drive certain cars, and they live in certain houses, and, and they do certain things, but your life's not that. For the believer, the Christian, our identity is in Jesus Christ. I'm a blood-bought, blood-washed, born-again child of God. I belong to Jesus, and my identity is found in Jesus, not in my stuff, not in my job, not what I own or what I do, and it shouldn't be that way for any believer. That's the way that God has made us to be, to find who we are in, in, in him and to be settled and satisfied with Christ because he's the greatest. All sorts of sins can come from this. Uh, what about not just pride and self-exaltation, but what about even greed? Well, I think I mentioned that one already. What about covetousness, hoarding, lying, theft can come out of that? I um, bought a car from Sparks Toyota. Sales dealer told me this used car had been checked out front to back. There was not a thing wrong with it. He lied. And if you sell me something that's broken, you tell me it's all right, I'll stand up here and talk about you too. But, um, yeah, I won't go back to them. And he may not have known he was lying, but he said he knew. There was nothing was wrong with it, and he was not telling the truth. But he made the sale and got the commission, didn't he? He did what he had to do. You know, there's all sorts of ways that um, people can do things out of love of money that um, are not, not well. People get jealous. We've talked about that recently. But remember, jealousy is when you say either, I don't want them to have what they've got, or I want what they've got for myself. And even hatred can come out of that. All sorts of stuff. So the love of money is a very dangerous, dangerous thing. It can lead to all sorts of other sins. It can, it can take your life in a direction God does not want it to go because he wants us to love people, love him first, love others second, but not love stuff. Lost people usually will use other people to get stuff. Saved people take the stuff God gives them and they use stuff to be a blessing to people. Do you see how different that is? So, love of money, it can lead you into sin. You'll hoard it, you'll keep it, you'll hold on to it, you won't help anybody else. It's all about me, 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 and it's all for me, 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 and my life is all about me. But it won't just lead you into sin, but it can also cost you your soul. Let me tell you how this is true. I'll use an illustration, an example from the life of Jesus. A man comes to Jesus, and he, he's... He's called the rich young ruler, so it's a very famous title for him that many of you may have heard of. He comes to Jesus, and he's very self-righteous and self-assured. He believes about himself. He's okay. He's on his way to heaven. He knows he's a sure thing to get in. But he doesn't want to tell you that himself. He wants you to hear Jesus say it. So he shows up to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, tell me what I got to do to go to heaven. Jesus says, well, you know the commandments, don't you? And then Jesus starts listing them. Do this, do this, do this. Now, when the Bible or the Word of God, and Jesus is the Word of God made flesh, when, when God begins to speak to you and starts to tell you the commandments, in your mind, here's what should be going on. Well, I hadn't kept that one. I hadn't kept that one. I fell short there. I messed up there. I, I, I missed a mark there. And so if you start telling me the commandments, I'm thinking, boy, I'm a mess. I've got no chance. I've got no hope. This guy was self-righteous. So when he starts hearing Jesus talk about all the things he should have done, here's what he says. I've done all that. I'm good, Jesus. So he is either blind or ignorant or something because he's a sinner just like all of us. So Jesus decides, I'm going to put my finger right on something that I know you're doing. And let's see how you respond. So Jesus says, why don't you do this? Go sell everything you have and come follow me. Then you'll have riches in heaven. Do you remember last week when we talked about marriage? I told you there was five purposes God gave for marriage, and one of the purposes out of the five, probably the most important purpose, is that every marriage is to be a picture of Christ in the church. And we, and we saw that out of the book of 1 Corinthians, and we saw how in the book of 1 Corinthians, Jesus is called the head of the body. I've got a head. My head tells my body what to do. My mouth's running because my head's telling it what to do. My arms are moving because my head is telling the body what to do. The body of Christ is the church. Jesus is the head of the body. 
So every one of us, the day that we get saved, we surrender to Jesus. We come under his lordship. Jesus is sovereign ruler over our life, and he is the one that is now called master, lord, God, and king because he is. And so we all are underneath him just as the husband is to rule over his wife as Christ uh, rules over the church in the sense that he loves his church and gives himself for her and 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 he now uh, leads her in a loving way that's the same sort of relationship that you have here so jesus loves his church and leads his church but understand that when we get saved we by faith turn to jesus this is the only way we can be saved but if our faith is real we believe in him as god lord master and king and we submit to him we surrender to him you can't, that's, without that, there's no repentance. Otherwise, what you're saying is, Jesus, I want to be Lord. I want to be over you, and I'm going to tell you how I'm going to live. And this is where Baptists get messed up a lot, because when we come under Jesus, when it comes to money, what we think sometimes is Jesus owns 10%. No, no, a thousand times no. Jesus owns 100%, not just your money, your life, your time, everything. Uh, everything is his. You, you don't put 10% under him. You put it all under him. So Jesus looks at this man and says, what? Sell everything you got. You come follow me. Now, if you're someone that has faith and Jesus speaks these words into your life, what do you do? I'm selling everything and I'm coming following Jesus because riches in heaven sound great to me. But what if you don't believe? What do you think they're going to do? He's going to go away sad, isn't he? Why did he go away sad? Well, I really want to hear Jesus say, I'm good for heaven. My ticket is stamped. I'm a sure thing. I'm guaranteed. And Jesus instead told me to sell everything come follow him. And I don't want to do that. I love my money more than I love Jesus. So he went away sad, but he also went away what? Lost. And 2,000 years later, I bet he's wishing he had another shot. But he missed a shot. He had a chance to turn by faith to Jesus, and he walked away. He went because he loved money. Love of money will keep you out of heaven. But friends, you don't have to just put money in there. You can put any sin you want to in there. You can put illicit sex in there. You can put alcohol or drugs in there. You tell me what you want so much that you love it more than Jesus, that you wouldn't be willing to give it up in order to have Jesus, I'll tell you what's going to keep you out of heaven. Because Jesus said, if any man wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up a cross and follow me. Jesus said, if you love your mama more than me, you can't follow me. You love your daddy more than me. You love your children more than me. You love your own life more than me. You can't follow me. You lay it down. You come. That's how you come, though. And if you really believe, you'll do it. And if you don't believe, you say, well, I'd like to have Jesus, but I want this too. And you try to negotiate, and you try to bargain, and you try to have a way to heaven that's not a narrow way. You want to take a broad way that says, I'm going to heaven, and I'm taking my sin with me. Well, if you go into heaven, you're giving your sin to Jesus. He's taking it to a cross. He's going to die there with it and for it, rise again, and give you eternal life. That's the only way to go. So you got to make a choice, don't you? And this man, Jesus, could have said, I'll tell you what, I'll take you to heaven, just say this little prayer with me, and you keep your riches, and you're fine. But his riches were as God. And Jesus says, in your life, you got room for one God. It's going to be me or your money. Now you decide. He said, money. But money won't save you. There's no stairway to heaven. It's only Jesus. So love of money can lead you into sin. Love of money can cost you your soul. But there's a way that love of money can be countered. It can be um, checked. It can be fixed. And the solution that you see here is this. In verse 5 it says, Be sure your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. So contentment, well, think of it this way. What if you lost everything that you have? Everything. 
And by the way, a lot of times when you lose your stuff, you lose your friends too, because there's some people that won't like you if you don't have anything. Have you ever found that out? If you ever get poor when you got money, you'll find out who your friends are. So you lose everything. Here's the question. You okay with that? Now, the, 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 you may say, well, preacher, you know, that's kind of just, it's a, it's a hypothetical sort of thing. Not for the people that are being written to. First century book of Hebrews, let me remind you what ver, uh, chapter 10 said. I'm just going to flip back a few chapters. Uh, listen to what it said back in chapter 10. Remember, beginning in verse 32, the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering. Great conflict of suffering. Partly be made a public spectacle through the reproaches and tribulations. They publicly embarrassed them. Uh, partly by becoming sharers with those who were treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully, listen, the seizure of your property. Knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. So, so they had, what's being talked about here, it's not just hypothetical. They lived it, and by the way, if it's been lived in the past, there's a good chance it's going to be lived by many Christians in the future. There's a reason the Spirit of God has talked about this and put it in the Bible for us. We're going to need it. So what happens when you start losing your stuff because you've got to make a choice, either I'm going to follow Jesus or I'm going to have my, my stuff. And for them, they've already made a choice. They chose Jesus, but it cost them greatly. What do you do when you lose everything? Are you okay with it? They were. Is your joy tied to your money, to your clothes, your house, your cars, your comforts, your entertainment? If you don't have that stuff, or let me ask it a different way. If all you have is Jesus, is that enough? Because that's really what it comes down to. I can be content because God has given me himself. And if I have nothing else, Jesus is enough. Now that's where you find contentment. And, and where we get messed up is that sometimes when we get saved, we fall in love with Jesus and we're passionate, hot-hearted, and, and you know our heart beats for Jesus. And all of a sudden, the devil starts coming along and tempting us and showing us dollar signs and dollar-dollar bills, y'all. And we, we start to grow in, in maybe in life in, in a position or a statue that starts to make us more money. And we start to fall in love with the things God gives us instead of the one that gave it to us. And we start to get tempted and pulled away. And we forget we, there was a time when we didn't have that stuff and we don't need that stuff. And if we don't have it again, we're fine. That's how it goes sometimes. But we, we forget that there's something a whole lot greater than the stuff. We can be content. And our contentment usually comes from faith, it comes from knowledge, and it comes from a relationship. So... I think we start to see in the rest of this verse some of the solution for us. It says, we're going to be content with what we have. And then he quotes two verses here that really give what I'm going to build upon here going into the end. He says this, I'm going to never desert you. I'm going to never, ever forsake you. So that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I'm not going to be afraid. What can man do to me? So let me give you a few thoughts about that. Number one, I can be content because God has given me his love. He's demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves us. But listen to what I'm about to say to you. God could not possibly love you any more than he does right now. If you've got a knob and it's one to ten, God's love for you right now it's maxed out. God will never love you any less than he loves you right now, Christian. God's love for you will never change. Now, that's a powerful thought, isn't it? You're not earning God's love. You're not trying to deserve God's love. God's love for you is settled. God showed it when he gave Jesus on the cross. 
God loves you. And God says to you, you will never be alone. That's what it said there in that verse. I will never desert you. I'll never forsake you. Jesus on the cross said what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So for us who are in Christ now, it's impossible. Christ endured what we deserve so that one day we can be satisfied and settled that we will never get what we deserve. He is Emmanuel. We say that, say, say that name a lot at Christmas time. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. He's God with us forever and ever. That doesn't change. He's always with us. He's never going to leave us, never going to turn his back on us, never forsaking us. I know that God loves me. He is with me always. I'm never going to be alone. I'm not now, nor will I ever be. He cares for me. You know, back in that, well, let me, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says this, are not, is not, are not two birds sold for one farthing, one like small little piece of money, one little penny? Over in Luke 12, the chapter I was telling you about, though, that's real good for us, he says, this, says it this way, aren't five birds sold for two? So back then, they had, it sounds like a subway deal, doesn't you get two for one or five for two? So I guess this deal they worked out. So, so you had these birds, but the whole point is this. Jesus says, and your father cares for even them. So even these worthless birds are worth almost nothing. If you think about the one bird that was worth so little that it was thrown in for free, you know, you buy four, I'll give you the last one free. You can take five. And Jesus said, the father knows and cares about even that bird. And he's making an argument from the lesser to the greater. If God cares about the sparrow, you know his eyes on you. You know he's watching out for you. You know he cares for you. God loves you. He cares for you. He's with you. God knows everything. He knows all. He's omniscient. God's not blind. He's not dumb. He's not indifferent. God's not uncaring, not unfeeling. He, he, he knows your loss. He knows your pain. He knows your financial needs. He, he's paying attention. He's not indifferent. We also know that God is sovereign. He is powerful. He is in control. And God is good. And God is kind. If anything bad comes your way, you, his child, have had, to, had it go through his hand before it ever got to you, which means he knew it was coming, he allowed it to come, and he's got a plan and a purpose and a reason for it, and he's working all things together for your good, for his glory, and even though sometimes we can't see his hand, what do we always have to do? Trust his heart. Bad's going to come our way, but there's a God who's in control, and one day we'll realize he was right to let it come, and he had a reason why he did what he did, you may not understand it on this side, often we never do. But on the other side, we will. So I know he's never going to turn his back on me. So I can rest in God's care. So what do we need to do with all this? Well, first is a little bit of humility goes a long way. I mentioned it already, but if we ever think about what we deserve, because sometimes we feel entitled but if I get what I deserve, I go to hell. I spend eternity in a lake of fire, burning flames, body and soul, there for eternity. That's what I deserve. God's not giving me what I deserve. God's giving me grace. He's giving me mercy. He's giving me forgiveness. God has washed away my sin, brought me into his family, made me his own, promised me heaven. I don't deserve any of that. You don't either. But God's been good. So, so, we, we, we could start there. We could maybe next, take the next step and have a spirit of gratitude and say, you know what, I may not have everything that I've ever wanted, but God sure has given me a lot. If I start to think about all the good God's shown me and all that he's given to me, I can come up with a pretty long list. I can start with the air in my lungs that I didn't create and God gave it to me to breathe and God gave me a heart that's beating right now. God gave me another day to wake up to. God even let me come to church today. That's a blessing. I mean, I could go back all of my life, every day of my life, whether I was saved or lost, doesn't matter. God has been good and gracious to me. God does it for every single person on this planet. There 
is good that God has shown. So I can be what? I can be thankful. I can have a spirit of gratitude instead of, again, entitlement and feel like God owes me something. And why, oh, why don't I have this and being bitter and thinking about money, money, money all the time? No, this sort of attitude frees you from money. Humility, gratitude, faith, that God is in control and I don't have to fear. You know, the people I mentioned that were in the first century that had lost their property and their possessions because they took a stand for Jesus, don't you see how this mindset liberated them? Don't you feel the freedom that they had to say, if I lose everything, it's okay because great is my reward in heaven and there's a Savior that's worth me giving everything for and I'm under Jesus and if it's his plan for my life and it's his will, I'm going to serve him. I'm more interested in being him being happy with me than the world being happy with me and I'll live for him even if it costs me everything. That's where they were. And that's where the word is trying to get us to go. And it's hard because we feel a connection with our stuff and our money. Jesus reminded us where your treasure is, there your heart is also. The more you've got, the harder it is to break this hole. Because I bet if you've got a retirement account, you've got an IRA, if you've got investment, stocks, bonds, if you've got a business, you've got a home, and see, everything you've got, you've got to maintain it. And so you've got to think about it. But, but, but you, you begin to dwell on these things and think about them, and you think about my car, my clothes, and this and that and the other, and you, it, it just it, it gets a hold on us. And God's trying to say, be content. Be content. Another thing you can do is focus on your relationship with God, fall in love with God, not your stuff. And then finally, work for the true riches, eternal riches, knowing that everything that you can gain in heaven is only possible because of Jesus, but that he gives you an opportunity to serve him in such a way that you can store up for yourself treasure in heaven. I talked with Jerry, the missionary that came the other day and spoke to us. Talked to her yesterday on the phone. She said, um, and we gave her a little bit over $3,000 as a love offering. She said, here's what I'm doing with the money. She said, I prayed about it, and here's what I've decided to do. I've contacted my, my guys that are in country. You know, she can't get back over into Africa, into Malawi, to, to do her work yet. But she's hoping that within the next month, she's thinking the airports might open up there because she's had a little contact with some people. But... She said, I'm going to go ahead and talk to them. We're going to take the money that this church gave. We're going to buy corn with it. See, that's what they live on over there. When you, if you go over there, all you do is walk through cornfields all day long. This is all they got to eat. They don't have grocery stores. They don't have anything. They grow it. They eat it. If they don't have it, they starve. The problem is most people over there are very poor. The average person over there makes about $240 a year. So when they finally get the corn, a lot of them have to turn around and sell it to the government. The government takes it, sits on it for about three months, and then the people run out of food because they sold their surplus to the government. They've got to come back to the government, and the government jacks it up about double the price, 150%, something like that, and sells it back to them. So they're in a constant state of poverty. She said, we're going to plant corn over there so we can feed the widows and the orphans. One day you're going to be in heaven. There's going to be a widow and an orphan that was over there in Malawi. You'll never meet that person, but you fed them. You see, so great is your reward in heaven. Great is your joy in heaven. That's what you're thinking about. Here's what 1 Timothy said. Before I read you verse 9 and, and 10, uh, if I were to go up a little bit higher, here's what, here's what Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied by contempt. For we've brought nothing into the world, but we can take nothing out of it either. If we have food and covering, you got a, something in your belly, and you got clothes on your back. With this, he says, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich, they fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. I um, didn't read this verse at the last service, so you'll get this as a bonus, but I know you've heard it before. Paul, when he was in jail and had been suffering and persecuted, wrote these words, I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret to being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance 
and suffering needs. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's not saying he can knock a baseball 500 yards over a center field fence. What he's saying is what? I can be in prison. I can be free. I can have a lot or I can have a little. I'm content no matter the circumstances. Because his satisfaction and his joy is based on what? Not on what's going on around him. Not on what he has. But who he has. That made all the difference in the world to him. So with that in mind, I'll give you one more thought to build on, and, and you can take this away with you. Peter, when he's writing in 1 Peter, is reminding us of what we have in Jesus Christ. And here's how he writes it. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. He says there's an inheritance that's coming for you that's ready to be revealed in the last time. The way he describes it, it's there because God knows the end from the beginning, so what he's got for you is already sitting there waiting on you. Now, here's a question. If something's sitting there waiting on you in heaven, is it going to be there when you get there? Well, how do we know that? How do we know it's going to be there? Well, here's what he tells you. He says, first thing is this. It's indestructible. Now, if somebody leaves you an inheritance and, and you get a house on the beach here, you might think, man, that is awesome. I got a million, two million dollar house sitting here. This is great. But then there's an earthquake and a tsunami. And it's destroyed. I forgot to put insurance on it. It's gone forever. The Bible says your inheritance is indestructible. Then it goes on and says this, and it's undefiled. You ever bought something new and said, man, I'm going to watch this thing. I'm going to protect it and get, take care of it. I'm going to keep it safe. And then it gets dented or it gets scratched. It gets marred in some kind of way. You know, sometimes we've got something really nice that gets messed up. And we're not so happy about that. What about your treasure in heaven? The Bible says it's not only indestructible, but it's undefilable. You can't dent it, can't mar it, can't scratch it. Look, nothing bad is going to ever take away from it. And then it says this about it. It says, and it will not fade. You ever got a new car? Had that new car smell? Ever had a new home? Had that new home smell? And about six months later, you say, oh, that smell that I paid so much money for. Now, I've never owned one, so y'all going to have to tell me about it. I, 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 all I've ever had is used cars, but... They tell me it's the most expensive smell in the world. And then about six months later, it goes away. When the Bible says it will not fade, there's nothing about the magnificence of what God's got there for you that will ever, ever, ever fade for all of eternity. Indestructible, undefiled, unfading, and then it says reserved for you. Now, when it says reserved, that's actually a military term that means it's guarded. It's like there's a treasure like Fort Knox, it's being protected. You couldn't break in Fort Knox and get the treasure out, could you, if you wanted to? No, you couldn't. Well, how secure do you think it is in heaven? Because some may say, well, I've got something up there, but what if it's not there when I get there, friends? It can't be stolen. It can't be lost. It will be there. God is watching out for what he's got for you. And then somebody might scratch their head and say, well, you know, that's real nice to know it's there, but what if I don't make it? Here's how he ends it. Reserved in heaven for you, you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Here's what God says. I'm not just watching over you. what they've got for you. I'm watching over you. You are protected by the power of God. God's going to make sure that what he starts, he finishes. And when God began a good work in you, he guaranteed he was going to complete it. So I'd encourage you in this way. Lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. Let your heart be on where your treasure really is, where the treasure that's really worth something that's going to last. Because when you talk, brought nothing into the world, you're guaranteed you're going to take nothing out of it with you, but you can send it ahead. So you live for the day that he's talking about here when your inheritance is going to be received, and it's going to be great joy, going to be great shouting, great reward for you in heaven. Great is your reward. That's what you want to be looking for.
Not what you got on this side, but what you can get on the next side. Now, we don't want to be presumptuous. None of us really knows what we're going to get. But here's what we know. God is fair, God's just, and God's gracious. So I have a feeling you, probably all of us will probably get, I know we'll get the right thing, and God may even add a little bit to it, above and beyond even. But I don't know. Live for that day. Humility, gratitude, relationship, work for the next life. Let your heart be free from the love of money. Use money to bless others. Now, you can't do any of this if you don't know Jesus. Just flat, I'll be honest with you. This is all pie in the sky stuff to you until there's a day in your life where you say, yes, Jesus, I want you. Remember how we talked about by faith surrendering yourself and submitting to him so that Jesus is Lord of your life? The reason they said Jesus is Lord because that's what it means when you say Jesus is my king. He is my master. He is over me. You have to, by faith, believe in him. But if you believe in him, you've got to receive him and accept him as he is. And he is nothing less than God Almighty. And so you've got to turn to him by faith in that way. But if you're ready today to give your life to Jesus, I'll be glad to pray with you. I'll be ready to receive you today and to help you to know him. So if you want to step out, we invite you to come. Let's bow our heads in prayer. This altar is open if anybody wants to pray for another reason. Uh, but let's turn to him right now as we before we sing. Father, we thank you for the word we've heard today. God, you've spoken into our lives and our hearts. God, break us from this hold that money has on us and stuff has on us. Lord, we're, we're physical, material people, and Lord, we've got to relate to this in some way, but we know that it's far more important that we love you than we love this stuff that you've given us. Lord, we don't want to be about our, the creation. We want to be about the creator the God who sent his son to die and to rise again that we might be saved. Lord, let us live for him and for the day that we're going to see him. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise for the joy that you bring us because of this decision that you put in our hearts to desire that we have a treasure in heaven to long for and to think about. God, help us do that and help us to be a people of God that live for eternity. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Church, let's stand up. Let's sing together. If you need to come, come right now.